Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland. Here I am at the grave of Eamon de Valera. His wife and children are buried beside him. I'm at Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. So um, Eamon de Valera was born in New York in 1882. Uh, it's born the same year as, um, as uh, ooh, <laughs> James Joyce, um, but obviously Joyce is born in Dublin. And here I am touching the top of his uh, cross and often think if you see where my finger is this exact corner you can touch here you can commune with me touch the exact place where I touched even long after my death this is as close as I'll ever get to him um, an absolutely towering figure in Irish history one with whom I fundamentally disagree but I have a little bit of admiration for him so um, his mother was asked so filling out the form your husband's not here um, where is he? My husband's, oh, he's away on a business trip somewhere else in the United States. He runs a pet shop. So your husband's name is Vivian de Valera. He's a Spaniard, right? Now, weeks later, she announced her, her husband had suddenly died. Nobody had ever met her husband. Historians looking into this were aware that Eamon de Valera had heard rumours that he was born outside wedlock. And the historian said there was no evidence of a Vivian de Valera in the United States at the time or a Vivian de Valera born in Spain the year... Um, that Eamon de Valera's mother said that he was born. This Vivian de Valera was an, a figment of her um, invention. She had an inconvenient unwed pregnancy, which was considered utterly shameful at the time. So she simply um, uh, invented a husband to cover up this uh, disgrace. Now, I don't think it reflects badly on her at all to be pregnant outside of marriage, but in those days they did. Um, anyway, so her, his mother's maiden name was Col. She came from um, Brewery, County Limerick. She brought back her child to be brought up by his grandparents and his uncle, and he was known as Neddy Cole in the village because he was Cole on his mother's side. His mother returned to the United States. She later married someone else, had a son with him, who then became a priest. So Eamon de Valera, who's writing to his mother these letters beseeching him to take her back to meet his stepfather, his, his, his um, half-brother, but his mother never ever did. So you've got to feel a bit sorry for the boy who was just another mouth to feed from a not-rich family. So he grew up uh, as a Catholic and an Anglophone family, despite you know Limerick being quite far west. Even by then, the 1880s, um, it was largely um, English-speaking. So he was very academically gifted. He went to Black Rock College here in Dublin on a scholarship. His family did, didn't have much money. He had thought of going for um, the priesthood. He eventually decided he didn't have a vocation. He was also aware that if it came to light that he was born outside of marriage, he wouldn't be allowed to do a papal dispensation. So the Catholic Church cruelly discriminated against those who, through no fault of their own, were born outside marriage. Why should they not have the same rights as anyone else? They're in a difficult situation. They should get compassion and help, not condemnation and, and degradation because of this. Anyway, a fortune obviously the Catholic Church has changed in that regard. So he went to UCD, he studied mathematics, he became a maths teacher, he, indeed a ma he got the title Professor of Mathematics. He had no higher degree, but in those days almost nobody did advanced degrees. So certainly gifted um, at that subject, um, worked in Tipperary and other places. He decided he wanted to learn the Irish language, and he fell in love with the Irish language so much that he married his teacher. Um, and she was a couple of years older than him. Um, obviously, he was he was in to his twenties when he met her. So they had, I think, it was five children, and he named his own son Bibion after his putative father. So De Valera, he joined the Irish Volunteers. He was involved in the Hoth gun running in 1914, and then 1916 he was involved in the Rising there, and he was commander of I think it was Boland's Mill was the last one to surrender. But that's probably just because he got the surrender order last. And he had a nervous breakdown when this was going on. At one point, he fell on the floor. He was a gibbering wreck crawling into the corner. Uh, would this be um, shell shock, something like this? He just couldn't take it. And um, so then he had his fanatical supporters who threatened the others. You never say a word about this, about the chief, what happened to him, because that would ruin his reputation. So they didn't come out for decades later that actually for a couple of days during the rising, he just couldn't cope. Finally, he gathered himself, and when he surrendered, he was there with composure. There's a photo of him with his hands bound behind his back, under guard by the British Army, and uh, de Valera is striking a very truculent, defiant pose. Like Anyway, so um, uh, I believe he wasn't actually sentenced to death, or was he, but then spared on the basis that he was an American. Um, he certainly wasn't executed, obviously, uh, partly because the United States was neutral. It was crucial to keep the U.S. on side. But then again, Tom Clark had become an American citizen. He was still topped. Um, so de Valera, he was spared. He was imprisoned um, in Frongoch, and then he was set free the following year. And then he stood in a by-election and won it for Sinn Féin uh, 
uh, Arthur Griffith stood aside to allow him to become leader of Sinn Féin, the party which Arthur, Arthur Griffith had founded. Remember, Griffith had believed in the dual monarchy, that there would be the Kingdom of Ireland, the Kingdom of Great Britain, and uh, the resurrection of Hungary was his book. That was his model, so that we'd have this um, symbiotic relationship with our neighbour to the east and still run the empire. Well, it wasn't to be. Then in 1917, Sinn Féin op adopted a Republican program and said, well, let's get a republic and then allow people to determine their form of government. Do they want a monarch? Shall we share the British monarch? Should we get a monarch from somewhere else? We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that once we split from Great Britain. And then, um, uh, so Doyle Aaron was elected in 1919. Well, really, it's the, it's the 14th of December, 1918, the election to Westminster, the UK Parliament. But Sinn Féin won 73 of the 106 Irish seats partly through intimidation and personation. Um, but anyway, um, rather than go to uh, the Palace of Westminster in London to meet, um, the Sinn Féinists met in Dublin, the Mansion House, that's the Lord Mayor's residence in Dublin, um, and to form the Doyle Aaron, as in the, the, the Irish Parliament. So, so they're very fair. They wrote to the Unionists as well, who obviously didn't show up. Uh, de Valera was actually in prison at that point because he'd been arrested in May 1918, the German plot. Um, the Germany was really desperate towards the end of the war, and one of their ideas was to start another insurrection in Ireland. Uh, it didn't come off, obviously, but British intelligence got wind of it, and they rounded up the usual Swiss suspects like de Valera. So then um, Michael Collins went over to Manchester in 1919 to help break de Valera out of prison. Um, it's not like in Michael Collins where he copied the priest's key by getting the key and pushing it into the hot wax to make an impression. No, it was the old, old story of, of smuggling uh, the key in in a cake that the guards didn't check too carefully. But how did they get the copy of the key? Or well, maybe that's to do with a candle and the, the hot wax. I don't know. Um, anyway, so he's back in Ireland. Obviously, he'd been hiding for a bit. Then um, he went to the United States to um, uh, propagate for the Republican cause, called, being called President of Ireland. Pre of Era was his actual um, title, A-I-R-E, not E-I-R-E, not Ireland. So some people translate that president. We now tend to say Uchtoron in Irish for president, or literally chieftain. Anyway, so um, there, then, he, then he came back. Then that was the truce of July 1921, and he didn't go to London to negotiate himself, got Collins to do it. I shan't limb his uh, very long and illustrious career, but then there was a civil war. He was defeated. He was in, captured in 1923, um, where, where he tried to sign a, stand at a by-election for East Clare, his old constituency. He, he'd grown a beard, shaved off at the last minute. He it was, it was advertised he was going to speak in an election meeting, and he did show up and speak from the podium for a few minutes before he was grabbed by the Free State Army and slung into prison, set free in 1924. And they said, well, we have to face facts. There's this new um, Doyle Aaron. To get into it, you have to swear allegiance to King George V, King of Ireland. So George V was the rightful King of Ireland. Repeat after me, King of Ireland. Um, and because Michael Collins, a lot of guys, former Sinn Féin IRA men, swore an oath of allegiance. And people like Cahill Brew said, if we accept this treaty in 1921, we will be voluntarily saying that uh, the, the British king is our rightful king. Yeah, we were saying that. And 75% of Irish people in the South voted for that. And even more people in the North wanted that, unionists or moderate nationalists. But um, anyway, so he said, well, we're going to have to do this. It's just a form of words. He swore an oath to the Republic. Was this uh, treasonous? Was he perjuring himself? Uh, he tied himself into knots um, thinking about this. So he was a bit of a philosophical gymnast when needed to be, he said, oh, it's just a form of words. And I think he had to sign the oath rather than swear it. And then he put his hand on the Bible, but put the Bible in the opposite corner of the room or something. But he did. He tried to get Sinn Féin to agree to just, we'll just take the oath and we'll enter Doyle Aaron. But a narrow majority of Sinn Féin voted against it. That faction of his who said, OK, we'll take the oath, however distasteful, we need to face facts and just move forward in, in politics. They became Fianna Fáil, the party which dominated Irish politics till 2011. Well, they're now back in government and coalition with Fine Gael. Michal Martin's the leader of Fianna Fáil. So um, anyway, it was a it was a it was a major test of whether they'd accept democracy. But um, who was it? Um, I think it's Sean Lamas, who's a right hand man. Fianna Fáil said um, Fianna Fáil is a slightly constitutional party, as in they would be a bit terrorist too. But 1927, um, Kevin O'Higgins, one of the main guys in the Free State side of the Civil War, who'd authorised many executions of IRA men, he was assassinated, leaving church at Drumcondra. By, by three IRA men, but uh, so um, that was when, 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 when de Valera in 1927 had signed the oath just after that, about a month later, to prove, no, I'm rejecting unlawful violence. Um, uh, anyway, a lot of guys, even if in Ford, approved of the slaying of O'Higgins, who was a hate figure because he'd authorized so many IRA men being, being, being executed in the Civil War of 1922 to 23. Anyway, um, de Valera, he, 
his party won the election in 1932, it was touch and go whether Cumann or Gale, the, the, the major party, would accept that. The civil war had ended only nine years earlier. Would there be a coup d'etat? So it won't take you in. And remember, W.T. Cosgrave had been Taoiseach, and some IRA people demonstrating saying Cosgrave and his murder gang are not a rightful government. Would there be a vengeful government if Finnefoil came in? But no, Finnefoil came in, De Valera was Taoiseach, and that was that. I'm um, trying to get more of what he wanted out of Great Britain. It was the Great Depression. It was very tough times. Um, uh, Patrick Pierce's sister said, we can't keep End uh, St. Enders going. Patrick Pierce's school, De Valera wouldn't give him a penny. The school went bust. His deranged sister lived in the school building for her, to her death a couple of decades later. So he uh, sort of hates on pensions of former IRA men, things like that. Started the economic war with Great Britain, refusing to pay land annuities. Got the treaty ports back in 1938. Successes for him, neutrality in the Second World War. I don't want to describe his um, career as far too lengthy. And then he, he, he lost office in 1948. He'd been teaching for 16 years. Out of office briefly, back in office as Taoiseach again. Stood down in 1959 and was president. Served two full terms, 14 years finally retiring in 1973, and he died at a nursing home in County Dublin in, in, in 1975 in August, just before school was about to begin, so the kids didn't get a day off school for his funeral. That was him, a fairly modest grave for a modest man. Um, so I've got to say he was self-effacing, he was dry, austere, um, a driven man. He, there's a rumour that his wife never spoke to him again after the death of Collins. I don't know if that's true. They lived at um, Greystones, um, County Wicklow. So his children were quite academic, but he believed a mother's uh, place was in the home, not working, partly because he missed his own mother. Um, but that didn't really work out in his case. So his um, daughter and son went to politics to get, get that far. Vivian had been an army officer. And then his, his, his granddaughter, Sheila de Valera, was a significant figure in Finnefoil politics in the 70s, right up into the 90s. So that is um, Eamon de Valera. Who was his father? Nobody actually knows. So um, supposedly half Spanish, born in New York, but ultra Irish. Um, doth he protest too much? Um, that is him. You think he might have some huge mausoleum or something. He cast a very long shadow, someone who dominated nationalist politics for almost 60 years. Um, so please follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Thank you so much for your most liberal donations, and I desperately need them in order to uh, continue this channel. Remember, I teach online history, politics, religious studies, French, law, geography, um, English literature and language. English is a foreign language, and I edit essays. I help you with a thesis or things like that, and elocution, interview practice. I give educational consultancy, and I'm a tour guide in Londinium. So please donate on PayPal, georgecallahan79 at gmail.com. That's all small letters. Callahan is spelled C-A-L-L-A-G-H-A-N. Gurumahaga.